Hello, uh, I'm Rex Astoria, and I am going to be telling you a beautiful story. A story about the Battle of Tonga. It is the early hours of November the 4th, 1914, in German Ostafrica. Africa. Two men stand watching the jungles as they see hundreds of British soldiers exiting their landing craft. Their names are Ernst Melker and Alimu Rashidi. They stand in their Schutzturpe uniforms as equals, in rank and in uncertainty, as they have no idea that one of the most intriguing battles in all of history is about to take place. All right, so the Battle of Tonga was the first engagement of the Central Powers and the Entente forces in the African theater of the First World War. So, this battle was immensely important to the success of the African theater to the Germans and is an important case study into the importance of training soldiers and planning in an operation. In short, the Battle of Tonga was an immense failure of the Indian Expeditionary Force B and will go down in history as one of the worst British defeats ever. Uh, the Battle of Tonga is also famous for another reason. the utilization of bees, B-E-E-S, by the German forces, giving the, the battle the alternative name, the Battle of the Bees. All right, so this video is going to compare the two starting forces engaged in the battle and will analyze the battle's developments in an educational and entertaining way, but without further ado, the Battle of the Bees. So the German Schutztruppe, which is protection troops in German, was the colonial defense troops, right? These soldiers were in charge of protecting the colonies and were staffed with well-trained and educated German officers with African Askari soldiers. German African Askari soldiers were actually very well paid compared to their Entente forces, and there was actually room for promotion and rank progression, even for the black Askaris. So it was very common to have two you know sergeants one white german sergeant and a scary sergeant uh, they were very well fed and cared for and this is in stark contrast to the entente forces the entente african Askari forces the the germans recruited the soldiers from the most militaristic tribes and families in german ost africa and they made sure that the tribes didn't have beef with each other right so there was no there was no place for tribal squabbling within the Schutzturpe. And this ensured that every soldier was loyal to only his brothers, the command, and the Kaiser. The Askari training was tough and extensive, but this ensured that they became masters of their terrain. The Askaris trained to weed out the weak, and German and intense German discipline was stressed in every Askari. Due to the difference of languages, the officers and the Askaris made attempts to learn each other's languages, and they communicated by a bugle call. The Schutzturper was constantly putting down revolts and combating banditry. And thus, the Schutzturper was very experienced in bushranging, because they were always fighting, always keeping at the top of their game. The soldiers of the Schutzturper constantly trained and were very experienced. About 2,700 Germans were eligible for service in German Ost Africa. Most of these people were in shooting clubs and the colonial police were also reserves. Uh, there's ex-military and hunters slash explorers, perfect for an army in kind of the frontiers of Africa. The Schutztruppe had one main drawback, right? It had the worst and most outdated equipment compared to a European army. They used, uh, they used really old guns that didn't even have smokeless powder. They used very, they had basically no artillery. They were very under equipped because if all of the important fighting is happening in Europe, why would they, why would the German high command ever send modern equipment, modern guns to such a place as German East Africa? So now understanding the German position, uh, the Indian Expeditionary Force B was in charge of capturing Tonga. These were the British forces from the British Raj, the Indian colony of Britain. The IEFB, which is what I'm going to call them from now on, 
was led by a fossil of a human being known as Arthur Aiken. Uh, the majority of the troops in the IFB were from the British Raj, aka British India. The British Raj also had other theaters of war that it needed to contend with, primarily in other parts of Africa and in the Middle East, where a lot of the Raj's troops were fighting the Ottoman Empire. This led to Aiken's army group being drastically undersupplied and completely and, and totally inexperienced. So when Aiken was assigned the divisions that he would have to take Tonga, they were stationed all over India and no one knew anyone, which is not great if you want to coordinate, you know, an army. Uh, he had only three months to regroup these troops for a naval invasion of Tonga, and training was just a total afterthought. He needed these troops now, and he was not, he, he couldn't, he didn't have any of the capacity to train them. It can also receive faulty intel uh, in relation to Tonga from Colonel McKay and Lieutenant Ishmael who Aiken assumed were specialists on Tonga. Major Norman King was the British consul in Dar es Salaam, and he reported that the colonists did not want to go to war and that they would take any chance to surrender. And he also reported that the native Africans would take any chance to revolt, which, to be honest, they very well may have. And he, Aiken also got lots of information on German troop positions, and he had intercepted letters that indicated that the German troops wouldn't garrison the coast for fear of British naval bombardment. This, of course, led him to believe that Tonga was either very wide open or very lightly defended. Um, Aiken was also massively racist and believed that his uh, and the German Askari troops could not fight competently. Uh, I thought I should throw that in there. Aiken was not a great person. <laughs> Captain Richard Meinertshagen, who is, is British, by the way, he just has a German last name, said that the IEFB was totally unprepared. I'll tell you a quote from Mr. Meinertshagen, um, quote, They constitute the worst of India. I tremble to think what may happen if we meet serious opposition. Which is not encouraging words from the high brass, and many officers did not believe that they could successfully invade Tonga due to just the quality of the troops and the unpreparedness of the IEFB. If they had trained, it very well may have been possible, but these are just fresh recruits who have had no training, are completely undersupplied, and totally unprepared, and again... No one knows anyone. Aiken was incredibly overconfident and thought that the Germans were just a bunch of incompetent, under-equipped, and uneducated clowns, basically. He apologized to his officers, uh, for to them for being, quote, part of such a simple affair. And he said that once they surely, surely curb stomped the Germans that he would find everyone comfy positions in France. All right, so now since everyone was in such a scramble, uh, to get redeployed and no one knew anything. Everyone was incredibly confused. The under-equipped, under-trained, and inexperienced troops were crammed into troop ships and set off for Tonga. These troop ships, as you can imagine, were incredibly overcrowded and it was super hot. Also, India is actually the most seafaring nation. So for many Indians, this was like the first time in the sea, in the open ocean especially, so seasickness was incredibly common in the ranks. All right, so now we understand the, the absolute state that the British troops are in. Um, the British did have one advantage, and that was numbers. They did outnumber the Germans quite a lot. I, I'm not sure of exact numbers, but it was a pretty hefty ratio. Uh, Tonga itself is a very jungled peninsula with very dense undergrowth. Uh, the port of Tonga was too small to dock really large ships. And Tonga also had a direct connection to the Usambara Railway. Although more reinforcements were incoming, only one German platoon was on Tonga to resist the first British wave. Um, and then 16 ships anchored off of Tonga at 0450. Aiken first needed to alert the Germans that the Treaty of Berlin was void and that the British were going to attack the colony. The Treaty of Berlin was a treaty that basically said that colonies are not going to be a part of the war to reduce bloodshed. 
the British decided to break this. It is unlikely that there is going to be a war between Germany and Britain and France and all of these colonial powers without colonial intervention. So the the Treaty of Berlin was very idealistic in assuming that, that they didn't want to fight. So the HMS Fox, HMS Fox, was dispatched to alert the governor of Tonga, Dr. Orisher, and ask him to surrender. Uh, however, the HMS Fox was stuck because of fear that the Germans had mined the harbor. So Dr. Orisher took a dinghy out to meet with the captain of the Fox. Um, the captain of the Fox, Francis W. Qualfield, Qualfield, gave the Germans two hours and 30 minutes to give their response for the British would attack. Dr. Orisher was threatened to be shot if anything happened to the fox. Uh, and he, when asked if the harbor was mined, uh, he didn't give a clear answer, and the governor was threatened to be shot again. So we're off to a great start for the British troops. All right, so the governor was no fool. He decided to call the great commander, Paul von Ledevorbeck, who I have made a video about already and is great, and you should absolutely watch it if you haven't already. Um, and Ledevorbeck ordered the garrison in Tonga to dig in and hold out for reinforcements. Um, the civilians of Tonga were evacuated, and in two and a half hours, uh, Dr. Orisher joined the ranks of the platoon defending Tonga. The nearest Germans were a four hour march away, and they set off immediately. The British actually gave the Germans closer to three hours, um, so at 10.45, when there was no response from the Germans, the Battle of Tonga began. All right, so the British plans. It, it was not a lot of plan, but uh, there was beach A, B, and C. How, um, but C could not be used because the fox spaced and forgot to check if it was mined. Beach B couldn't be used because the fox gave intel reports that thought that the Germans had already ranged out the artillery, their artillery, and if the and if any troops landed there, they'd just be smoked by artillery. Um, this left Beach A, which was small, muddy, and swampy. The Fox could give reconnaissance support to Aiken, but communication was very, very slow because the two spaced and forgot to put a liaison officer in charge. So we're really just firing at all cylinders in the British High Command right now. All right, so finally at 1740, Caulfield had finished mine sweeping, and 20 minutes later, the first landing craft of British troops disembarked. It is very difficult to describe the total disorganization of these troops, but everyone was super confused. And if the Germans had any form of resistance directly on the beach, the slow moving and disorganized British would have not fared well to say the least. Luckily for the British, the Germans did not wish to meet them directly on the beach and instead took defensive positions a little further inland in the thick dense vegetation. So now at 2230, the initial British forces hit a coral reef and had to exit at chest high water and waded onto the beaches. It was not looking good for the British coming off the coming off the bat. The forward German scouts saw this absolute skullduggery unfold and informed Lord of Orbeck, who started to head over with a few battalions of his own to reinforce Tonga. This I, I must mention because it's too funny not to. Lord of Orbeck's Ascari troops, morale was very high. Um, not because they were going into battle and thought that they were going to win, but because traveling on the railway is really fun and always a great delight. <laughs> Alright, so at 0230, this is, we are late into the night, the 13th Rajputs and about 4th, 6th of the companies of the 61st Battalions were ashore. At 0430, Brigadier General Tigay, who, uh, who is British, ordered the machine gun elements of the 13th Rajputs to move up and take the telegraph office and the jetty. The Indian troops were totally unequipped, untrained, and demoralized. They also had no experience in the African bush, and it was a slaughter. At 0515, they reached the town of Tonga, but came under very heavy fire from the 17th Feld Company, which was extremely well dug in. They also had to cross an open field, which was a death sentence, 
so no one dared push further. At this time, reinforcements from the 61st Pioneers should have been able to reinforce in the battle, but had not even disembarked from their ships yet. The British officers attempted to exercise their numerical advantage by opening up a firing line. However, when they tried to expand this firing line, they would always come over, come under heavy machine gun fire, and the Indians completely refused to move on any further. Uh, this scene was described by a British captain I mentioned beforehand, Richard Minertagen, quote, Our British officers behaved like heroes, but none of them had a chance, with our men running like rabbits and jabbering like monkeys. Again, not very good things coming from British high command. At 0630, Lieutenant Marensky had a four-mile march to Tonga. The 17th Feld Company was at its breaking point and had very li little ammo, but it held on stubbornly and waited for reinforcements. An hour later, Marensky's detachment arrived at Tonga and relieved the 17th Feld Company and continued defending. While this was all happening, at 0630, the Fox completed its mine sweeping of Beach B, so the second loyal North Lancashire could move in. But Tigay was worried. He was not sure if his troops could hold on long enough for the second LNL to land if the Germans counterattacked it. Brensky seized the initiative and counterattacked. The 61st Pioneers were scared of the machine guns and broke instantly. The 13th Rajputs were right next to the 61st Pioneers, and they could hear the absolute carnage that was unfolding and right, right next to them. And the inexperienced troops were frightened and retreated against their commander's will. So imagine you're part of the 13th Rajputs and you just hear your comrades, you hear machine gun fire and then screaming and then they're all running and <laughs> you're scared, okay? I don't care how brave you think you are, you're scared. And they all retreated against their commander's will. The HMS Fox, remember that ship, uh, fired 12 shells directly into the hospital at Tonga. And at this point in the battle, it was completely full of injured British troops. The commander of the Fox did not want to shell the hospital, but he spaced again and forgot to put forward observers so the captain was just blind firing into Tonga, trying to hit anything that looked important. I should also mention that the hospital staff of Tonga did stick to their Hippocratic Oath and treated you regardless of what uniform you had on. And they did their best with what little supplies that they had. All right, so it's nighttime now, and this is a very successful day for the Germans. Some troops uh, moved into where the British had retreated and captured a lot of equipment that they left behind during their hasty and muddled and terrible retreat. Uh, about a thousand, 1,000 Indian troops were huddled around the Red House and everyone was absolutely terrified. Seeing the absolute state that his men were in, Aiken decided that he needed to switch them out for fresh troops. Neither General Tige nor Aiken would order any reconnaissance for the rest of the day. Aiken also then ordered the rest of the infantry to come ashore, except for the 28th Mountain Battery, which was positioned on the deck of the Barata. I must stress that Aiken never ordered any reconnaissance at all. So now the 27th Bangalore Brigade finished landing at 0930, but Aiken delayed the attack so his troops could have brunch and not fight on an empty stomach. Uh, commander Baumstark, uh, the German commander Baumstark was unaware of the sad condition of the British troops and did not counterattack. So he retreated uh, from Tonga so his troops could rest. This means that the entire town was left wide open and since the British never ordered any recon, they didn't know that they could have taken the town with absolutely no resistance. At this time, German reinforcements started arriving, and Baumstark explained the situation to Paul von Ledvorbeck. Ledvorbeck then got onto his bicycle and personally started gathering reconnaissance. 
I don't know how he could pedal with his massive testicles, but that's beside the point. So once Leder Vorbeck comes back from his little bike adventure, he orders the fresh German units to garrison Tonga again. And it was also at this time that the governor of the colony, Dr. Einrich Schnee, whom I covered a little bit uh, in my Paul von Leder Vorbeck video, uh, Dr. Schnee was just bitching about how, oh, there could no, be no harm to Tonga and that the colony should just surrender it. Um, Leder Vorbeck said no to this kind of stupid order and replied uh, with the quote, to gain all, you must risk all, which is such a little great quote, I love it. The British got into position to attack German defenses and attacked the German flanks. The HMS Fox and the Barata attempted to provide naval bombardment, but because there was absolutely no fire support communications or forward observers, the naval bombardments did absolutely nothing except probably blow up some poor Toucan's house. From 1200 to 1400, the IEF pushed up two kilometers through tough jungle terrain and constantly skirmished with the Schutzsterpa. The organization of the IEF was basically non-existent and due to the poor physical conditioning of the soldiers, the 63rd Palmera Light Infantry was disintegrated the first time it came into contact with the Germans. The 98th Infantry was in close po proximity to the Palmera Light Infantry, and when they heard a burst of machine gun fire and then hundreds of men screaming and running for their lives, the 98th totally collapsed and everyone ran. And this is when they saw the bees. Multiple hives of African bees swarmed after the British and Indian soldiers, stinging everyone in their sight. The bees chased the soldiers all the way through the jungle for a while, until the scared soldiers finally outran them. The, after this, the 13th Rajputs were at bat again, and they were shattered immediately, and in their retreat they took the 61st Pioneers with them. The 2nd LNL and the Imperial Service Brigade were able to gain a small foothold in Tonga, but brutal house-to-house -house fighting ensued between the British and German 6th Feld Company. The British officers tried to reorganize the broken units, but were mostly unsuccessful. The 101st Grenadier Division attacked the German 16th Feld Company, and they were completely stopped by the machine gun fire. This was Lederborbeck's signal to counterattack and the and swing the 4th and 13th Feld Companies and mowed down scores of British troops. The morale damage was so extensive among the British soldiers that many simply refused to fight anymore. Uh, Leda Vorbeck steamrolled any opposition and one by one the British units fled in disarray. The Germans had the British on the ropes but decided they needed to rest up before the final advance and the German army buglers called out for the advance to stop. Alright, so Captain T Baumstark abandoned Tonga again to regroup. Um, and on the other side, Tige and Wapsher convinced Aiken that they could no longer attack or defend in their current situation. And the stubborn Aiken finally agreed to a surrender. The British sent over Mindershagen to negotiate a truce with the Schutzterpa. Uh, and as a result of the Battle of the Bees, much blood was shed. Um, both sides had to treat hundreds of wounded, and the recently shelled hospital was working day and night to save as many soldiers as possible. Soon as the truce was called, German soldiers rushed into the British camps and took about a year's worth of supplies. I need to restate this because this was instrumental to the success of the German Ost African campaign in the years to come. The Germans took a year's worth of supplies. A year's. The final casualty numbers came out to 817 casualties for the Brits and 145 casualties for the Germans. This is nearly a 6 to 1 casualty rate. This is one of the worst military disasters in all of history. However, Paul von Lederbeck did say that one of the killed Germans, Captain Tom von Prince, was not easily replaceable. Um, Battle of Tonga was a massive victory for the Germans, and it supplied them for a year. Uh, and it delayed a British attack 
into German East Africa. And without this battle, things part of the, the campaign in German East Africa for the Germans would probably have failed. As a history guy myself, the Battle of Tonga is it's one of the most interesting things to read about when I'm bored in history class. I, I just really want to share this story. I am Herx Astoria. Thank you for watching. Like and subscribe if you enjoyed. And if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them in the comments. Uh, goodbye and have a great rest of your day.